Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Buddhang damang sangkang namasami. <clears throat> so as most of you will be aware, the monastic community are in the middle of their annual rains retreat. And I'd like to say a few words about that to start with because people sometimes misunderstand what that means. They think that we're uh, in complete retreat, in seclusion, and uh, the monasteries have shut down for three months, and that's certainly not the case. If you come to either of the monasteries, you'll find that they're uh, functioning as they usually do with people bringing the uh, alms food and uh, with talk and a blessing and with the opportunity to meet with the senior Sangha. In the monastery itself, this is actually uh, a time where we shift the emphasis away from uh, manual work, maintaining the monastery, building the monastery, and also uh, going outside the monastery to teach. And where we actually give quite a lot of time and uh, energy to formal teaching within the monastery. So particularly for the senior uh, sangha in the monastery, uh, this is a time when we take on extra teaching, teaching the vinaya, the uh, rules and uh, lifestyle of monastics, and also uh, sitting in formal meditation, with the community and having regular uh, interviews and giving instructions in meditation. So it's not that the monasteries are shut down or it's not that we aren't doing things, it's just that we're, uh, the emphasis is uh, slightly different at this time of year. And some of you will be familiar with how this rains retreat period was instituted by the Buddha back in the time when monastics didn't have fixed places to stay in. Uh, Monks and nuns used to travel all over the countryside and they didn't come together for any extended uh, period of time. They would be uh, moving around wherever uh, the Buddha was staying or whether where some of the uh, senior monks and nuns were staying. And they moved around even during the rainy season when the farmers had planted their crops and they were waiting for the crops to uh, come through, break through the soil and grow. And because the monks and nuns were moving around the countryside at that time of year, they very often trampled on the crops as they were uh, growing. And people complained to the Buddha that this wasn't something which was helpful. And it was because of this primarily that the Buddha instituted this three months of the year during the rainy season when monks and nuns should stay in one place They have to stay in a place that's a dwelling that has a door at least and uh, that's the standard that we uh, use for uh, dwellings that they have to have at least be able to have a door fixed to them and that they should stay for the three months of the rainy season and to make good use of that time to do more formal meditation practice and to... uh, meet with more experienced monastics to learn more about the lifestyle and the rules of uh, the life. And so that's what's grown up uh, in the Buddhist world for this uh, three-month period. 
it was never intended that monks and nuns should go into uh, complete isolation. In fact, the Buddha chastised uh, monks who spent the rains retreat without speaking to anyone. He said that's no way to uh, develop the mind. Of course the mind will be more peaceful when you don't have to uh, engage with anyone. That's not the way to do it. What your, the practice involves is cultivating the mind so that the mind can be peaceful even when it has to engage with others. And this is the uh, point which I'd like to speak around this evening. Even though we are still engaging with the world and still involved in meeting with people, it is a time when we consciously watch the effect of stepping back from some of the busyness that's involved in running and building and maintaining a monastery and also living together in a community. Any of you who live in houses, in apartments, know that there are always things that need to be done, even if it's just keeping the place clean and tidy. There are always meals to be uh, prepared or at least to be uh, gone out and uh, bought. And uh, there are always things to see to in the family, just in living together with people. There are always things that come up about the relationships that we have with each other and how the food is uh, prepared or who gets the food or who cleans up uh, after we've had the food. So those things are a part of uh, living and those things have to be attended to in the monastery just the same as they do in an ordinary household. But as I said, we shift the emphasis during the rains away from that kind of uh, preoccupation to spending more time in formal practice and that involves moving into a quieter space, trying to narrow the focus of our uh, attention, of our preoccupations, narrow it much more to the inner world rather than the outer world. We're still engaging we still have those things to do. But because we're able to slow down in this uh, time and to restrict the things that we get involved with, we don't go out teaching so much, generally speaking. We don't go out pursuing things, generally speaking. It becomes easier to observe the one who's doing, the one who's going out, the one who's getting drawn out. That is looking at things from the perspective of the doing, the doer, rather than the thing that's being done. Achan Chah gave a very nice simile for what we're trying to do. He gave the uh, image of a bottle with oil and water in it. And when that bottle is still, the oil and water are very easily seen to be different, to be separate. But when we shake up that bottle, the oil and the water mixed together and you can't tell which is the oil and which is the water. And he said that the mind and our relationship to the world is like that. The mind and the world are separate just like the oil and the water. But because we mix up in the world so much 
we lose track of what is actually the world and what is the mind. The world being things outside ourselves, objects, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touch and also objects of mind, thoughts, thinking. These are all the world. These come into our inner world through the sense doors, through the eye door, the ear door, the nose door, the tongue door, the mind door of thinking and the touch door of the body. And the mind gets mixed up with those objects, gets mixed up with the world through the process of thinking, seeing, smelling, tasting and touching. That's how the world comes in, inside. And we get drawn out to those things. We see something and we like it and we want it and then we think, how can I get that? And then we put into action what we need to do in order to get it. We get drawn out to that thing. And the desire that arises within our mind and all the effort and energy that goes into pursuing that thing until we obtain it, that's the world coming in and the mind getting stirred up. Stirred up so much, caught up, mixed up, that we can't tell where the world stops and we start. We're in the world and the world is in us, just like that oil and water mixed together. And when we're engaged in everyday life, we're pursuing so many things. We are experiencing so many contacts. We're getting stimulated by so many wishes and desires, so many dislikes and irritations that we certainly do lose track of where we start and where we end. What's the world and what's us? What's the mind and what are the objects that the mind knows? The objects that the mind knows and the mind that knows those objects are two different things. But ordinarily, we can't separate them. We can't separate them like the oil and the water shaken up together in the bottle. So our practice is making that bottle still so that when it's still, the oil and the water separate out. Making the mind still so that we can notice what is the mind and what are the objects that the mind knows. The objects that the mind knows are the world. It's not only objects like form, things that we can see, material things, not only sounds, like music or someone's voice, but what that produces internally, the ideas about those things, the wishes about those things, the planning to get those things, the stories about those things, stories about what happened in the past, with that person or I know that thing because I've had one like it previously. Our ideas, our memories, all of those things we take to be me but in fact they're also the world because they are objects which the mind can know. In the meditation, first of all, we know the body. We start to pay attention to how the body feels. It becomes an object 
for our awareness. And then we narrow the focus of our awareness of the body down to the breath. And we focus on the breath. And that becomes the object of our awareness. And as we stay focusing on one thing long enough, the mind does does start to calm down. And then when the mind has calmed down sufficiently, I asked you to look at the quality of attention with which you're watching the breath. When you're looking at the quality of attention with which you're watching the breath, you're looking at the mind. The mind is looking at the mind. But the quality of attention that you're looking at becomes the object. Both the subject and the object. The watching and what is being watched. To be able to observe the mind as an object of attention shows us that those things which we take to be me and mine are also objects which arise within the mind, a thought. These are also the world in Buddhism. The world is not just what is outside this body. The world are also those ideas, preoccupations, thoughts, plans, memories which arise within the mind but which are produced through contact, through experience through repetition, through habit patterns. They can be observed and so they can't be me. They can't be ultimately what this mind is, it's what this mind contains. To get to the point where we can really know that we have to be in a situation where things can slow down and that's the purpose of going on retreat that's the purpose of spending special time removed from one's normal routines and one's normal busyness one's normal duties because it's usually only in that kind of environment, in that kind of situation that if you like the bottle stops shaking and the oil and the water start to separate. We start to be able to observe the mind as an object, as an object for our attention. Normally we observe what's going on outside outside this mind and body, the things that come in to our mind through contact. So we spend a lot of time observing other people, what they did and how they do this and why they did this. We look outside a lot of the time and we also attribute so much of what we're experiencing because of them. They did this to me. They make me feel like this. Looking out, looking out, looking out. And we're so busy that we never have a chance really to stop and see what we're doing. To notice that although there is a trigger outside us, What is triggered is within the mind itself. And if it wasn't in the mind, it wouldn't be triggered. So when we're able to take time away from the busyness, then we start to observe 
not the triggers in the outside world but the content of our inner world and particularly when we go into seclusion as we do have the opportunity to do during the rains retreat at the monasteries uh, people in turn get a chance to spend uh, a week or two weeks some some longer uh, in seclusion so many many of the uh, objects out there so many of the things which we which trigger off our internal reactions are just removed from our environment now this happens in the monastery anyway because we uh, don't have television we don't have uh, radios we don't uh, have videos all of the things which are uh, normally uh, very uh, powerful stimulants for the mind but uh, we have the normal person to person interactions and that's quite enough to trigger off all sorts of uh, reactions and when we go into seclusion we don't have those things and we don't have our duties that we have to do and the way that we do them and we don't have the routine the relentless routine of the monastery the same thing day after day after day and it has to be done by a certain time and someone's always looking over your shoulder to see whether you've done it the right way all of that's missing when we go into seclusion and yet we find that many of the same ideas many of the same emotional reactions are still in the mind even though they're not being triggered by anyone or anything outside where are they coming from then we may notice that we are still holding on to memories we've got lots of uh, old stuff that we can uh, call up that can produce those uh, same reactions but the idea that all of our troubles come from someone else the people that we live with or the people that we work with or the situation that we have uh, our home situation or the kind of traffic we have to deal with getting to work or the people who uh, service in the shops or whatever it is we think is the source of our problems we start to realize that there's uh, that's not the whole picture that there's something within the mind whether others are there or not that is causing a large part of the distress that we feel in our daily life may not be acute distress it may just be a feeling of dis-ease or boredom or lack of satisfaction or whatever anxiety why are we anxious why aren't we content why are we always thinking about what's going to happen next and we can't put the blame for that we can't find uh, a locus for it a place for it to be anywhere else except in our own mind when we are able to slow down and step back and be in seclusion it becomes obvious that it's not out there not the world out there it's the world in here but the fact that we can start to observe that world that we can objectify it that we can pay attention to it and notice it starts to reveal to us the fact that what we take to be me because it's happening in the mind again are objects objects that arise according to causes and they pass away and those objects don't have to be believed they don't have to be given credibility they don't have to be acted on they just have to be known ah anger is present boredom is present anxiety is present and we allow it to pass through the mind 
and pass away. To be able to observe the content of the mind in this way, seeing it as objects which can be observed, which don't have to be engaged with any further, this requires training and it requires practice again and again and again. Now in the meditation there were a couple of points which I was trying to uh, make you aware of experientially, that is not just me telling you in a talk but so you could observe for yourself about the way that we pay attention to things. The way that we pay attention to things affects what we see in that thing or what we get from that thing. So if we are paying attention to the breath with boredom or irritation or lack of energy, then it's very hard to focus on each breath. There's very little enthusiasm for the breath. If the mind is energetic and bright, if we feel goodwill towards the breath, then it becomes interesting to watch the breath. It becomes delightful to watch the breath. We can notice the details of the breath and the mind sinks into the breath. And because it sinks into the breath, it sticks with the breath, doesn't wander anywhere else, and then we find that a peaceful feeling arises from within the mind itself, not because of the breath, but because of the fact that we've been able to maintain continuous attention on the breath, not wandering away, but focusing in. It's the quality of attention that allows us to sink into the breath, to stay with the breath, and to uncover that peaceful, easeful feeling that lies within the mind itself. So the way that we watch something will affect what we see, what we get out of it, and also what we pay attention to will affect the way that we're able to focus in on that object. So when we pay attention to very gross objects, when we continually fill the mind with very strong stimulation, for example, if we watch a lot of videos, very, uh, um, with very strong uh, impact on the mind, we'll notice that the mind gets very jaded we don't get the same uh, stimulation, we don't get the same uh, delight out of very pleasant things. We don't get the same kind of uh, aversion out of uh, very strong uh, stimulation, like we, we become uh, less sensitive to violence, for example. We become less sensitive to very subtle things because the mind is... Uh, habituated to very strong sensory impressions and so it takes a lot to get us to take notice, to be really uh, affected by what we see. So the more that we expose the mind to strong stimulation and we don't give the mind the opportunity to refresh, relax, unburden itself, calm down, the mind becomes less and less able to see what's there and less and less willing to put in the effort that's required to see something, and I'm talking about seeing as a, a mental seeing, knowing something, it takes a lot more effort 
the mind is resistant to putting in the effort required to see things that are more subtle. And so we can notice, for example, in our relationships with people, when we uh, have a very busy day, when we're interacting with a lot of people and uh, we just have had enough of interacting with people, then we might meet someone that uh, normally we would be interested in. Normally we would like to see them, but we're on overload. We've been uh, too stimulated. And so we don't really pay much attention to that person. We don't give that interaction much of our uh, energy. We don't really pick up the subtle cues from that person. So if we want to be able to develop the mind in meditation, the mind that is able to start to see more subtle things, to start to be able to observe not only the impact of objects from outside on the mind, but what's going on in the mind itself, what objects within the mind what reactions they're producing, then we have to guard the mind. We have to refrain from continuously exposing it to very strong stimulation. Otherwise the mind becomes unable and unwilling to focus, to stay with whatever it needs to stay with and it becomes unable to pick up anything that's subtle. And when we have that jaded feeling in the mind, then the quality of attention that we bring to bear to any situation means that we're going to be less able to see that thing clearly. So what we pay attention to affects the mind and affects how well we're able to pay attention and how well we pay attention will affect what we see, what we get out of that object or that interaction. And this is why we take time to go on retreat. This is why this three month period of uh, changing the focus of what we do in the monastery is so important. It's interesting just to reflect that the way that it came about in the first place was because people complained about the monks and nuns trampling the, the crop. There wasn't even, uh, in the or origin of this um, uh, tradition, there wasn't the sense that we needed to withdraw from uh, the normal routine and spend more time in seclusion because in the time of uh, the Buddha there weren't... Uh, so many complexities that people had to deal with. As I said, many of the monks and nuns were uh, not living in any fixed place and so there wasn't uh, the work to do in uh, building and maintaining, doing all those things. That came later in the uh, life of the Sangha. But in the beginning, that wasn't uh, the case. And so it was possible in those early days for monks and nuns to uh, spend more time just focusing on their meditation practice, just coming together to listen to uh, the teachers and remembering in that time there was not only the Buddha but many enlightened monks and nuns, many very developed practitioners that um, uh, newly ordained uh, monks and nuns and those who hadn't uh, reached uh, stages on the path to enlightenment, they could go and uh, be with those teachers, listen to those teachers and have that as a constant uh, input in their life. But uh, these days when we don't have uh, such easy access to those uh, kinds of teachers, then it's extremely supportive to be able to spend time uh, more focused on the work of the monastic life 
to spend more time in formal practice and it's something which even those of us who live in the monastery uh, all the time we noticed the impact on the mind when we slow down, when we stop some of the busyness and when we spend more time in formal practice and study. It's possible to notice how the mind opens up to the teaching, opens up to the processes that are going on in the mind, how it becomes easier to do the work that needs to be done. And so this is uh, something which I'd like to pass on to all of you if you have the opportunity to do a, an organised retreat, whether it's for a weekend or for longer. If you have time to uh, spend a few days in the monasteries, uh, not at this time of year because they're fully um, occupied, but at other times of year, to take some time away from your normal duties, away from your normal preoccupations, to step back. This will be of tremendous benefit in being able to uh, take a fresh look at what's going on in your own mind. Sometimes if you just take time at home, set aside a day of the week, if that's not possible, part of the day of the week or one day a month when you don't do what you normally do, when you give yourself completely to a day of formal practice, maybe sitting in meditation, then listening to a recorded talk, sitting in meditation again, doing some walking meditation, learning some chanting, you'll find that it's extremely beneficial for refreshing the mind, brightening the mind and giving you that quality of attention that allows you to focus inward rather than to focus outward. And of course if you do it only one day of a month you'll find that it takes longer for the mind to settle down and you might find there's even strong resistance to overcome. That resistance might come in the form of sleepiness. You might find that uh, you've taken a day off to do meditation and all you can do is uh, fall asleep on the cushion and that's an indication very often that the mind needs a break. The only time ordinarily that we stop, sit quietly and don't do anything is when we're going to sleep and so the mind thinks that now we've stopped, now we're quiet, now we're not doing anything, must be sleep time. And so if you don't practice stepping away from your ordinary life on a regular basis, you'll find that most of the time that you do spend on that day will be sent, spent just catching up on the uh, rest that you haven't had, that you haven't been giving the mind throughout the rest of the month. But that can be a good learning experience you can recognise through that happening just how overwrought the mind is. And then you can ask yourself, how can a mind that is in this state possibly see to the depths of the Buddha's teaching? And this is how we recognise that if we want to be able to see what the Buddha was pointing out for us, we're going to have to do something more. We're going to have to support the mind more. We're going to have to create the conditions in our own life that will allow us on a regular basis to stop, to step back and to refresh the mind. And only when we do that, when we commit ourselves to doing that, can we hope to be able to
to really see into this mind and really see the difference between the mind and the world. To allow that jar of oil and water to be still long enough for the oil to separate from the water. Otherwise there's just too much busyness, too much movement and we never know what's the world and what's the mind. What we're trying to cultivate is the knowingness, the knowing that can observe, be still, maintain the balance, whatever comes in, we know that it is something that comes in temporarily passing through the mind and passing away. When we're able to do this and to do it regularly then we find a real refuge within our own mind, within our own heart. But this is a refuge which needs to be developed and it needs to be practiced. Achan Cha said in this uh, particular simile that it's only through practice that this can arise. It can't arise simply by wanting it to happen. So for all of you, I encourage you while uh, the monastic community is on uh, Rain's Retreat to reflect on the fact that even the monastic community benefits greatly from having this time uh, apart. And if you wish to uh, develop those benefits in your own life, then you need to look at what you can do to create the conditions for being able to step back, to stay still and then to look deeply. So may this teaching be of benefit to all of you and may the merit of this teaching help us all to attain Nibbāna. So if anyone has any questions or comments, I'll be happy to answer. For, for going on a long retreat, it's best to start with a short retreat. And so, for example, in the Buddhist society, we have uh, three weekend retreats uh, a year and then uh, two 10-day retreats a year. And so it's very uh, helpful if you start off by attending uh, a couple of weekend retreats. You get an idea of what a retreat is like and what the mind, how the mind reacts to being in that kind of situation. Um, we often have all sorts of ideas about what the mind will be like once we get the chance to be quiet. And this is uh, one of the things we observe when we go on retreat, that even when it's quiet out there, the mind doesn't uh, become quiet automatically. And so when we go on a weekend retreat, we experience that for ourselves, that even though we've stopped doing the things we normally do, the mind is so full of those things that very often we uh, don't find much space and quiet in the mind until after a couple of days of that uh, weekend retreat. But we get a taste of that quiet. And so doing a few weekend retreats makes us aware of uh, what it is that we're uh, undertaking. And then after we've done a couple of weekend retreats, it's useful to do a 10-day retreat. And these are, all of these retreats are advertised well in advance uh, at the beginning of the year so that you can, uh, even if you're working, look at taking time off if you need to for the 10-day retreat especially, um, working up towards it, Doing a daily meditation practice is also very uh, important because if you just do uh, a retreat and then you don't meditate at home, you find that whatever benefit you've gained during the retreat will very uh, easily um, be lost 
because uh, you're not supporting the mind once you're out of retreat. So all of these things are the way of working up to a longer retreat. So a daily practice, a weekend retreat, then a 10-day retreat, and then uh, if you've got the time and the uh, interest and the money, the opportunity, then there are places or meditation um, retreats all around the world that you can go to for longer periods of time. Um, once you become a skilled practitioner, um, you can stay in the monastery um, at Serpentine um, for a longer time. But again, um, if you want to stay in the monastery, you need to start off by going to spend a day or two there, getting used to um, what it's like in the monastery, um, showing that you can manage to be in the monastery in that environment and um, conform to the standards that are uh, required there, that you can be happy just doing your meditation practice and not um, having other entertainment. And little by little, as you uh, build up the strength of the mind, then uh, it's possible to go and stay at the monastery for a week or two weeks and uh, do your own retreat. So there are options available, but it's best to start with establishing your own practice at home and then beginning with a weekend retreat. So one of the strongest lessons comes when we finally get the conditions that we uh, always wanted we don't have anything to do except meditate, don't have any distractions, and then we find how difficult that is, that we uh, often get into a battle about uh, why we can't meditate. Well, of course I could meditate if it was a bit warmer, or I could meditate if, uh, if I didn't have to uh, stay in this particular kuti because um, uh, I don't like the feeling in this kuti. Or uh, if the food was different, if I could just get the things that I like to eat. then I'd, uh, If I hadn't got, didn't have this coming up after my retreat, then I could really retreat during this retreat. But because after my retreat I've got... And so you see what the mind is like even with the conditions that you thought would, would uh, make it possible for the mind to be happy and peaceful, still doesn't come. And that's what we're learning. We're learning to look at the mind as the object of our attention. The thing that we focus on is the mind itself. As we become more aware of that, then we don't buy into what the mind is telling us. And because we don't buy into it, because we don't feed it, gradually even those thoughts and ideas, those emotions settle down. They don't uh, uh, continue. But that takes time and practice. So I think if there's, there are no other questions, we'll end there. And um, I think Albert has some uh, announcements.